All right. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Hello. I want to talk to you today about your nose. Now, don't worry. I'm just a chef. I'm not a doctor. I don't have any terrible news to give you about your nose. Your nose is fine. In fact, I think that all of our noses may help us solve some of the biggest problems that face the world of food. Okay. But before we, get to your no before we get to all of that, we need to talk about your tongue. Now, how many of you know this image of the tongue? All right. This is the one that I learned when I was in school with the four tastes, bitter, sweet, sour, salty, all lined up in perfect little rows right around the perimeter of your tongue. And if you did an image search today for the word taste, you would find very similar pictures in all of your top results. And that's a problem because this is wrong. You see, our taste buds don't line up in perfect little rows around the edge of our tongue. It'd be really cool if they did, but that's not how it works. They're scattered all over. And there aren't four tastes, there are actually six. Now, a lot of you may know about umami, um, known as the fifth taste, savoriness. But recently, scientists also discovered taste buds that just recognize fat. So we have six tastes. Now, think about that. When you take a bite of food, your tongue is only recognizing six things. When we describe how something tastes, we use a lot more than six words to describe it. Usually, what we're talking about when we're describing how something tastes is its flavor. And flavor doesn't come from your tongue. It comes from your nose. In fact, 80% of what you taste, what you taste when you take a bite of food, comes from your nose. Now, say you take a bite of cake. Now, as soon as that cake hits your tongue, your tongue goes, Woo! Sugar! This is great. I love it. But as that cake sits on your tongue and as you begin to chew it, these little tiny molecules called volatile compounds or aromatic compounds are being released. They find their way up the back of your throat and to your nose. And again, your tongue is, woo, sugar, I love this. But as that's going on, your tongue is sorting out this barrage of aromatic compounds and, excuse me, your nose. <clears throat> your nose is sorting out this barrage of aromatic compounds and going, well, actually, this is chocolate cake and there's a bit of hazelnut, and it has a cherry filling. This is quite delicious. And your tongue is like, woo, sugar, okay? Now, I may have just oversimplified the whole physiology of taste a little bit there, but I think you guys get the idea of what's going on. So let's take a look at one of these aromatic compounds to see and understand how they work. This is mesofurane. Now, it looks like your average drawing of a molecule, atoms and bonds and whatnot, but if you could smell a bit of mesofurane, it smells like freshly baked bread and butter. It's delicious. I like to dab a little behind my ear sometimes. My wife loves that. But what's really interesting about mesofurane is that it's one of the key aromas in the flavor of strawberries. You see, sometimes it can take hundreds of aromatic compounds to make a single flavor. In the case of strawberries, we're talking about 348 aromatic compounds just to create that flavor that you taste when you bite into a strawberry. Now, of course, we can't see these tiny molecules in our food, but we know that they're there because you know, scientists have figured that out for us. And we can find the information of what molecules exist in all of our favorite foods by looking them up online. There are academic papers we can look into and there are databases that hold all this information, like the volatile compounds in food database. And this is really important information because there's something incredible that we can do with this. We can actually use this information to predict how different foods are going to taste when we put them together. And that's amazing because otherwise, the only way to know the way two ingredients were going to taste when we put them together was to just know it through experience or exploration. It was, you know, old school. Okay. But now we have this ability to look at compounds as data displayed on a screen, which is incredible. Now, technology has helped cooking evolve throughout history. It has changed the tools that we have access to to cook food. The internet has changed the way we share ideas, the way we learn about other cultures and other ingredients. Think about refrigeration and modern transportation. They've completely revolutionized what ingredients we have access to. And I could have any ingredient in the world delivered to my door in 24 hours. When we look into the science of shared flavor compounds, we'll find something like this. 
for methyl pentanoic acid, which again looks like your average molecule. But when we look into the ingredients that share this compound, we find things like tomatoes, cheese, baked wheat. That's right, it's pizza. Now finally, we have scientific proof that pizza is in fact delicious. So we can use this science of shared flavor compounds not only to help us understand why we love some of our favorite foods, but we can also use it to help us find new combinations of ingredients. When ICE was working with IBM on the Chef Watson project, for those of you who don't know about Chef Watson, um, a few years ago, IBM took their Watson technology, cognitive computing, to culinary school to the Institute of Culinary Education in New York City, where I work. And we had the chance to work with the Watson team to look into the science of shared flavor compounds. And in that work, among the many things we found, we found this, gamma dodecalactone, which smells kind of like suntan lotion. It's fruity and tropical. And we can find gamma dodecalactone in chicken and mushrooms, which probably sounds great to a lot of you. But we also find it in strawberries, which we thought was really weird, but really interesting too. And we decided that we really needed to try it. And we did, and it was delicious. I mean like really, really good. And that amazed us because if I looked at these ingredients as three ingredients sitting on the shelf of my refrigerator, I would have never imagined putting them together in a dish because I see them as ingredients that don't seem to make sense together. But when I kind of look at these ingredients as aromatic compounds as the data of flavor displayed on a screen, these hidden connections begin to reveal themselves between the ingredients. And I can see the connections and think, hey, this is probably gonna taste pretty good. Now, this process of creating a new dish as a chef is long and, and tough. You know, normally to find a combination like that, it would happen through trial and error. And it would take weeks or, or some chefs work a lifetime to try to find a new combination like that. Something that's surprising and that actually tastes good. Okay. This process of creating a dish for me uh, as a chef, it's, it's a process of trial and error. We you know, begin accessing taste memories, thinking about all the things that you've tasted before, ingredients that you've seen put together before. And then you go into a mental database of, of ingredients that you know work well together because you've seen them in other people's recipes. You've been exposed to them in some way. And so you take all this information and you create a list of ingredients that you think work well together. And then you take that list and edit it down to a smaller list of ingredients that you want to use to create a new dish. And that's a big process that you go through before we even get to the moment of stepping into a kitchen and beginning to cook. So in this process of creation, we deal with this idea of decision fatigue. That so much mental time and energy has been used up before we even get to the process of creating. I have very little left when it's actually time to make it happen. So if we could use this science of shared compounds to help pick the ingredients and cut out that lengthy process, and focus all of our energy on making our food better, then we could do incredible things. Now earlier I suggested that our noses would hold the key, would help us solve some of the biggest problems we face in the world of food. And this is how we're going to do it. Every year, 1.3 billion tons of food is wasted. That's one third of all of the food that's produced globally that never gets consumed. Now, what if we could use this science to make food that we commonly waste more delicious, like celery? Now, how many of you have bought a head of celery for a recipe, used a couple pieces, and then let it sit in the bottom of your refrigerator until it got soggy and limp, and you eventually threw it out? I know I've done that myself. So I decided to do a little bit of work on celery and look into some of the shared compounds that we could find and find some interesting ingredient matches. And we found things like vanilla, and coconut milk, chilies, and shrimp paste. So I took those into the kitchen, and I made this. Now, how many of you would want to eat a grilled celery salad with chilies and shrimp paste and vanilla, right? It looks delicious, right? You should want to eat it. It is delicious. I have eaten it, okay? All those hands up there, that's a couple hundred heads of celery they were already saving. So you see that we're off to a great start here by using this science of shared flavor compounds. Now, producing all of this food is a great strain on our natural resources. 
Raising cattle for beef uses 11 times more water and 28 times more land than raising a chicken. So what if we could reimagine a classic beef recipe, something like a hamburger, but better for the environment? And since we already know that foods with shared flavor compounds are more delicious, let's go back to gamma dodecalactone. Okay? Remember, that was chicken and mushrooms, right? This burger is made with 30% mushrooms. So not only is it engineered for deliciousness, but it's also using less protein to create the same size patty. Okay? But if you remember, there was something else about gamma dodecalactone, those strawberries. So we take those strawberries and cook them down with more mushrooms and spices. We turn those into the ketchup for our burger. And let me tell you something. If you put this together, take a bite of that, you'll never miss your beef burger again. And because we're building these flavors naturally with shared aromatic compounds, we're actually able to make food that uses less fat, less sugar, and less salt and tastes better. Now, I think that's pretty powerful. Now, before I finish here today, I've got a little bit of homework for you guys. Later on, when we're in the break or tomorrow when you have your next cup of coffee, I want you to hold your nose just like this. Take a sip of coffee. And what you're going to taste when you do that is, well, nothing. Because we've cut off the pathway for nearly 800 aromatic compounds to get to your nose and help you taste that coffee. It's going to be just warm, bitter water. Take another sip of coffee. Let go of your nose this time because you look ridiculous doing that. And take another sip of coffee. And after you swallow it, breathe out slowly through your nose. And let all those aromatic compounds filter back up and see how many of the flavors you can pick out. Hopefully we'll be drinking some good coffee and you'll pick out a lot of nice flavors in it. And finally, next time you're sauteing up some mushrooms, I want you to throw some strawberries in the pan. Maybe put it over some chicken. Give it a taste. Let me know what you think. I think you're going to like it. Thank you very much.